My name is Sharon Dirks. I'm a freelance speaker and author, um, and uh, also an adjunct lecturer at OCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Um, and yeah, I'm going to just unpack a little bit of this question of um, if God is real, then why are there natural disasters and diseases? Before we start, of course, there's the shameless book plug, um, which in my Britishness I'm learning to do. Um, but I have recently uh, released a book on this precise question, um, looking at the question of natural evil. How do we make sense of um, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, and so on? So everything that I say and more can be found in Broken Planet, where I weave um, stories of people who have encountered all kinds of different natural disasters firsthand um, with apologetic responses for how we might make sense of these intellectually. Um, yeah, stories from humanitarian aid workers, uh, tourists, local people in the face of earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, wildfires, locust infestations, pandemics, and so on. So if that's of any help, do check that out. I think there are copies in the bookstore. Um, just down uh, down the stairs. So even in the last uh, couple of months, we've had the earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria, and over 50,000 people lost their lives. Perhaps um, a good number of us in the room can remember where we were on 2004, December 26th, when a wall of water surged onto beaches in Thailand, Indonesia, and southern India, killing almost a quarter of a million people and displacing nearly two million people, the, what's known in Britain as the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, we could name all kinds of others, like Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Haiti 2010. And we really can barely go a couple of months without hearing about another natural disaster. How do we make sense of natural disasters like this? And furthermore, what about the impact of disease and sickness? We may not have been caught up in a natural disaster, but we have all one way or another encountered illness, um, perhaps are even as we speak. And in the last three years, um, COVID-19, in a sense, has been a natural disaster that has come to our own doorsteps, uh, something that has impacted everyone. Nearly 7 million people have died worldwide in the, the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we make sense of uh, disasters and diseases? There are no easy answers, but it is important to know what the things are that we can say, um, because suffering is arguably the hardest question of all and the biggest barrier to faith in God. If someone's going to uh, not believe in God or walk away from God, often it is related to an experience of suffering. Stephen Fry are just about there in the image, but some of you may remember an interview that Stephen Fry gave on Irish National TV in 2015, where he was asked by the interviewer Gay Byrne what he would say to God if it turned out that God existed and he found himself at the pearly gates. What would Fry say to God? His response went viral and has since been viewed over 8 million times on YouTube. And he said this, it's known as theodicy, I think. I'll say bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world where there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It is utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world that is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eye. Why did you do that? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a creation where that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. And we can tell, and if you watch the video, you can tell from uh, the way that Fry responds that these are questions that are felt very deeply. And this question is so important because a slightly different answer is needed compared with uh, a response to why humans are so cruel to each other. Often when, as Christians, we're responding to questions of suffering, part of what we the response we give is a free will defense. We say that humans have been dignified with freedom 
but they can use that freedom for good or bad. Uh, but that doesn't seem to work when we talk about natural evil. Um, it works for moral evil, but not for natural evil. Um, there are different kinds, and we need a different kind of response in this regard. It seems that, that you know, this is um, evil that is coming from within nature and our biology, and these are things that a world that supposedly God has made. So how do we make sense of this particular form of suffering? So, uh, in opening, <clears throat> some things to think about. The firstly, firstly, if God does not exist, how might we make sense of disasters and diseases? Well, you may remember the late Christopher Hitchens, best-selling author and atheist, um, who was interviewed in 2011 on CNN about his terminal diagnosis of cancer of the esophagus. And he was asked, whether despite his atheism, he had been tempted to ask the question, why me? And he responded like this. He said, you can't avoid the question, however stoic you are. You can only bat it away as a silly one. Millions of people die every day. Everyone's got to go sometime. This response is particularly bleak, especially since he's now died. He died later that year. But it is consistent with his atheism. Because for Hitchens, there were no disasters as such. There were merely events in the natural world. If God doesn't exist, then we, we are living in a closed system of the forces of nature acting on matter. And so how do we make sense of natural disasters? Well, we look to mechanistic explanations and scientific explanations. If there is no God, then earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes are the outworking of the laws of nature. We can look to things like cause and effect and probabilistic explanations as well to explain why there are things like bone cancer in children and other rare genetic diseases. If you think about the number of DNA molecules in one human body and the number of human beings on Earth, then by chance alone, sometimes DNA replication is going to go wrong, leading to genetic diseases such as bone cancer in children. And insects that burrow into the eyes of children that Fry refers to have not made some kind of morally evil decision to do so. This is a neither right nor wrong. They're just doing what they're hardwired to do, which is eat, eat whatever is in front of them. Uh, and so if we look purely to scientific explanations, there aren't any disasters as such. This is just the way the world is. And these kinds of explanation may solve the problem intellectually for some and get rid of the seeming internal inconsistency that belief in a loving God presents. But they don't make sense of the raw emotions that we experience in the face of suffering and disasters. These responses don't speak to hurting people because we experience them as disasters, even if intellectually we categorize them and park them in a different way. We experience them with anger, frustration, and grief. And this suggests that scientific explanations alone are not enough to make sense of why there are natural disasters and diseases. You see, for a person in pain to object to suffering is to recognize that there is something wrong with the world. And it expresses a longing that things ought to be better than they are. In other words, when we uh, object to suffering, when we say this is wrong, we're, we're invoking standards of right and wrong that arguably sit beyond simply human preference and apply to more than one person. And actually, in terms of uh, where people are, are coming from, in terms of uh, the moral argument today, uh, we, we have moved away from a time when um, moral values are seen as being more relative and subjective into a time when actually a lot of people do believe that objective moral values exist, but they don't necessarily believe God is needed to make sense of them. But the question, where, where are the best explanations for, for the origins of objective moral values? Where, where do the best explanations for this come from? 
Well, there are a number of <clears throat> philosophers uh, known as the non-theistic moral realists who, who make a case that, well, objective moral values simply exist. They are facts of the universe. They are self-evident. Um, and we don't need to kind of make a case for where they come from. They just, they just exist. Um, and this is a, you know, a really interesting view and a, certainly a breath of fresh air compared to kind of the um, relativistic uh, arguments that were being put forward in the past. But is that the best explanation for where objective moral values come from? Um, is it enough to say that these values are self-evident or are they, you know, morality occurs in relation to people. It involves actual people. It's not an abstract concept. It involves people. And so where do the best explanations come from? If God doesn't exist, then we are living in a non-moral universe of time plus matter plus chance and somehow morally sentient beings have arisen from within this universe now that's not impossible but it's surprising given that the rest of the universe is non-moral or amoral however if god exists then moral beings are entirely consistent with the starting foundations because god exists We've lived in a moral universe all along. And God is good and has created a universe with the potential for evil. And somehow that potential has become actual. And so we can make a case that objective moral values by which we judge things to be right or wrong, they don't just exist, they're not just abstractions. They make most sense if God exists. And so actually the Christian faith is uniquely able to speak right to the heart of the question of suffering. There is something wrong with the world and it impacts people, it impacts our biology, it impacts nature. Um, good and evil exist together in this world because God is good, but evil has also come to exist uh, alongside it. And there's an irony here that many reject God because of the suffering and that they see around them. But we could make a case, you can make a strong case that the rawness and the anger that we feel in the face of suffering actually makes more sense if God exists than if he doesn't. And our, our pain in some ways is a pointer not away from God but towards him. Because a Christian faith says there is something wrong with the world. You are right to feel that way. It's not enough to simply say this is just the way the world is. Okay, let's change gear a little bit and start thinking about um, weather systems. Um, it is a helpful thing for us to do to look at uh, the surrounding planets in our solar system and look at the kinds of natural disasters that they have um, to compare them with what we see on Earth. And if you look at um, Venus, 80% of the surface of Venus is volcanic. We know that life is untenable on Venus. If we go the other way and look at Jupiter, we see the great red spot, which is um, an anti-cyclone that has um, the size of two Earths put together has been around. It's a, a storm, uh, double the strength of the strongest hurricane on Earth, been around for at least 400 years with temperatures of around minus 163 Celsius. It calls for a redefinition of the term extreme weather. And on Venus and Jupiter and every other planet that we know of, life is untenable. And so we need to be mindful of this bigger perspective before we think about life on Earth. It could have been the case that natural disasters on Earth were such that humans could never have existed or just we couldn't survive. But somehow they are within limits, they are boundaries such that life is still possible. And so it's, it's helpful to zoom out before we focus in and remind ourselves that it's a wonder that life even exists in the first place. Second thing that it's helpful to say is that natural events also, or some of the mechanisms involved 
uh, in natural, uh, natural events are uh, also create beauty and sustain life. The mountain ranges that we climb up in the summer and ski down in the winter, and indeed the ocean trenches, uh, the, uh, such as the Mariana Trench in the Atlantic, these are formed by the riding up and the forcing down of tectonic plates against each other over time. We also know that uh, many island formations are from uh, the, the cooling of volcanic rock, which cools to form land masses. And the Hawaiian Islands, the Azores, and so on are formed in this way. <clears throat> Some natural events create beauty. We also know that many of the mechanisms uh, some of the mechanisms behind some natural disasters are, are needed to sustain life. So tectonic plate movement uh, is a mechanism that recycles nutrients from deep beneath the Earth's crust back to the surface. Um, we also know that mountain ranges have a pivotal role in the water cycle. They cause, enable cool air to continue rising and rising until it condenses and falls as precipitation through uh, streams and back into rivers. And vast areas are supplied with water because of the water cycle, which is made possible because of mountain ranges. And uh, Robert White, a geophysicist, makes the point that monsoons in the Himalayas uh, provide water for a thousand million people in India through this very process. We would also say that volcanoes provide channels which release pressure and gases back into the atmosphere from beneath the Earth's crust and the soil um, around um, a volcano is incredibly fertile. That's why people live around them. One of the stories in Broken Planet is of a whole village, a thousand people that live not just near a, a volcano, but in its crater. And for this, I mean, craters come in all different shapes and forms, but, but basically in a volcano. <laughs> um, and no one has ever died there from a volcanic eruption. <clears throat> and the reason no one has ever died is they know how to read the signs, by the way. <clears throat> Apart from the kind of spewing of ash and so on that um, gives actually a good deal of warning. Apparently when a volcano is about to erupt, the locusts start coming out of all the cracks and crevices and heading off. And they know that if the locusts are legging it, then it's time for the humans to do the same. <clears throat> so um, anyway, that's beside the point. Even flooding, so we, um, even flooding can be beneficial in some cases because it brings an influx of valuable nutrients um, and the flooding of the Nile is vital. Some of the mechanisms that undergird natural disasters um, are vital for sustaining life. So we begin to see this question isn't straightforward. And even uh, in biology, we see this. Uh, we've, we've just come out of this pandemic, but you may know already that most viruses are not harmful. There are trillions of them in the biosphere 99% of them are in fact essential for life. If you were to get rid of all viruses, uh, as Tony Goldberg, an epidemiologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison says, if all viruses suddenly disappeared, the world would be a wonderful place for about a day and a half, and then we'd all die. And that's the bottom line. All the essential things they do in the world far outweigh the bad things. And viruses are key to ecosystems, they stop in bacterial populations, they stop any one uh, population from becoming too dominant and overcrowding everything, it enables plankton levels to be at equilibrium on ocean beds, that enables the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere to be uh, maintained. <clears throat> they have all kinds of uses and, and are vital for life. But there's this 1% that is pathogenic and occasionally throws us into pandemics. So this question is not straightforward. It's not as straightforward as we might originally think. And I want to highlight two, primarily two positions, and these are not mutually exclusive. They can both be true, but they're two ways of looking at this uh, question. The first view, is to look at uh, natural and human factors. And then after our discussion time, we'll look at spiritual factors. And this first view 
says that basically that natural events are not inherently wrong in and of themselves. They only become a disaster when people are hurt or die. I don't know if you uh, remember seeing on the news a few months ago a new volcanic fissure opened up in Iceland and uh, people began rushing to see uh, this, this new uh, uh, landscape that was a few days previously just a normal mountainside and suddenly it was spewing red orange lava and people were getting dangerously close. No one was hurt but it was a reminder that there is something quite striking and awe-inspiring about the rawness of nature when nobody is injured or hurt by them. And we actually, there may be instances of this in the Bible where people have been struck by the beauty and majesty of, uh, of nature in a, in a natural disaster sense, but it's not being referred to in a negative way. It is something that's beautiful and points to God. For example, in Psalm 97, we read that the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. And another instance in Psalm 104, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. Are these references to earthquakes and volcanoes? It could be that there is something beautiful and awesome about some forms of natural disaster, not all, but some, that are not necessarily wrong in themselves. They only become a disaster when people get caught up in them. And so <clears throat> in this first view, one of the views put forward is the natural law view, which is essentially saying that we need these, this is the way the world is, these mechanisms have been um, built into the world and the flip side of having these mechanisms that occasionally people get caught up in them and there is suffering that comes as a result. <clears throat> um, the stability of the natural world and the forces of nature also enables humans to live meaningful and exercise their free will. So if I um, wanted to take a drink of water and we lived in a world where the laws of nature were not stable and could do different things at different times, then as I go to pick up the bottle, it might fly off the table around the room or do something unpredictable, which means that I can't choose to have a drink in quite the same way that I can if I know it's going to do the same thing every time. So the natural law view is saying this is what's needed for a, a stable world to exercise free will, but the flip side of it is that people get caught up in them. But of course, <clears throat> proponents of this view face the challenge as to why God couldn't have secured free will and a stable natural world in a different way, using laws that don't somehow yield disasters and diseases. There are no easy answers to that, but uh, certainly people do need to um, think about that. So this view is saying natural events in the world are not inherently wrong. They may even say they existed before the fall and may even exist in heaven. But the impact of the fall is that we've become vulnerable to them in several ways. One of the ways that we've become vulnerable <clears throat> is through the impact of poverty. If you look at the number of deaths um, in a, a developing, uh, in a low income country, uh, when a natural disaster happens and compare it with something similar in a high-income country, number of deaths is several orders of magnitude greater in the low-income country because of the effect of poverty. We could compare Haiti 2010 and <clears throat> California 1989. Um, California, um, they both had a similar strength earthquake. 57 people died in California. Several hundred thousand died in Haiti. Same earthquake strength strength, very different levels of suffering. Not that, I mean, even one life to be lost is, is cataclysmic, but, but there's an impact of poverty uh, that undoubtedly increases the, the number of deaths. And also um, things like human negligence that impacts uh, whether a building survives a, a quake or not. We saw this in Turkey and Syria as well. We saw it in Haiti 2010, even luxury hotels were pancaking because they hadn't had steel rods put into their structure. If they'd had steel rods, they would have swayed and stayed upright and people could get out. 
but instead people were just buried under buildings. And so humans have a way of making these things worse, whatever the reasons for their occurrence. Of course, we see this even in the high-income countries where there are different demographics and in something like Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, people in, uh, with um, vulnerable people were worse affected in, in Hurricane Katrina, uh, for example, many other examples of this as well. So how else have we become vulnerable? Well, um, arguably through climate change, and I'm aware that in evangelical circles, there is still conversation as to the extent that this is really happening. But I think in the scientific community, it's very clear that temperature on Earth is rising and has risen exponentially, uh, particularly in the last uh, 100 years, uh, in fact. Um, and human factors have been significant in contributing to that through our use of fossil fuels releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which is causing the temperature to go up and this has led to an increase in the frequency and severity of some kinds of natural disasters so hurricanes are now more frequent and they are stronger and they're slower which means they offload more water so the flooding is worse uh, we could look at wildfires are burning hotter and longer and whereas cooler fires used to uh, have a regenerative effect, a, a hotter wildfire just incinerates everything and there's no life afterwards. Um, things like locust infestations have also grown and become more severe and are just ravaging areas in an uncontrollable way. So climate change is, is significant. So we're vulnerable to natural disasters through human factors, uh, through some, some of the things that humans do or don't do. It, it increases our vulnerability to some natural disasters. And the same is true of um, disease and sickness, particularly in low-income countries. And structural inequality plays a big part. You're probably aware of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, Melinda, in her book, The Moment of Lift, describes the process of having her eyes open to the vast differences between rich and poor in terms of their vulnerability to disease, especially in children. And one of the drivers uh, for them to start the foundation was the realization that children in poor countries were dying from conditions that no children died from in the United States. Things like malaria and TB or diarrheal diseases, complications in childbirth, which are all entirely preventable in high-income countries. So structural inequality caused by poverty and injustice undoubtedly increases our vulnerability to many kinds of natural disaster and disease. And so this is all to say, before we break at the end of part one, there's no such thing as a purely natural disaster. They are always a complex combination of natural factors or biological factors and human factors. Both nature and people are involved in the impact that any natural disaster has. I just want to maybe speak for another 10 or 12 minutes, maybe 15, about uh, the other side of the, the argument, which is that, um, that actually you know, all the things that we've talked about, the natural and human factors are one thing, and they are important and significant. Um, but on their own, they're not enough. Uh, we can, st it still leaves some questions unanswered. Why is there that 1% of pathogenic viruses? Why do our bodies tend to, towards decay and death? Uh, why are there childhood genetic diseases? Um, a deeper level of explanation is needed and it isn't enough to simply say that this is just the way the world is. And at the heart of this side of uh, the argument is that spiritual brokenness has led to brokenness in nature. It is to say that nature is broken and that has a spiritual cause. Uh, this is something that I guess is harder to talk to non-believers about. Um, but that is uh, part of how we make sense of this. Um, and uh, the Apostle Paul in his 
letter to the church in Rome describes the natural world as being in a state of frustration and transition. He said, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself um, will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So much there in those verses, uh, lots of different things that we could say. But in, in a very broad sense, these words are pointing out that the natural order is not at peace with itself. It is not finished. It is in a state of frustration, writhing, groaning. Uh, the, the, the imagery here is of a woman in labor. And of course, a woman in labor is not in a finished state. Uh, she's about to produce another human being and is in a state of transition. Um, there is more to come. And we could make a case the same is true of the natural world. Uh, it is not in a finished state. And the, the pains and the creaks and groans that sometimes emanate are a reflection of this incompleteness. Our world is in transition and there is still more to come. And of course, we know that the Bible, the very end of the Bible speaks of not so much of heaven, but of a new heaven and new earth in which God will make everything new. But at the moment we see frustration and transition. And so this view is saying that Spiritual brokenness has led to brokenness in nature and biology. Nature itself is broken. Well, how did nature become broken? Well, there are two angles that I wanted to highlight in this time. One is what we consider the kind of mainstream traditional view that there was a human fall and that somehow dragged um, the natural world and our biology along into the brokenness. So. Uh, Adam and Eve, the early humans, uh, re you know, rebelled against God and fell, and somehow uh, the, the natural world and our biology was impacted. Um, we know in Genesis 3 that the Lord said to the woman that her pains in childbirth will greatly increase. Note it doesn't say begin, um, it says increase. So there's an effect on biology. And secondly, that to the man, the very ground itself will be subject to a curse, uh, making it unpredictable and hard to work with. So there's an impact on the physical land, on the, the, the physical um, world. Um, and so somehow the spiritual condition of humanity has impacted the natural world and our very biology. And that's a fairly mainstream view and probably the, the one that we're most familiar with. Um, proponents of this view, which we can call the human fall view, um, if you take an old earth perspective, and I'm aware that people take different positions on the age of the earth, but if you do take an old earth perspective, we face the challenge of how we make sense of the fact that volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and disasters like these were happening long before humans arrived on the scene. And so that is something that people of that view need to wrestle with. How do you make sense of that? Um, and then another view that uh, I've found to be helpful in, in thinking about this is to talk about uh, the possibility that there might have been two falls, that there's a human fall and there's a pre-human fall. Um, and the reason why this has a biblical basis is because in Genesis we see that the serpent is in the garden already. And the author says very, it says nothing about how the serpent got to be there, how long he had been there, and the damage that had been caused in the meantime. And is it possible that nature became broken before humans were? Um, and this is known as the, the pre-human fall view. Now, to an extent, it's a fairly mainstream position that we do believe there was a pre-human fall. Um, it's the closest we get in talking about the origins of Satan, that there was a, uh, he's a fallen angelic being. And this position simply takes that further and says what might, could have been the impact on the natural world of the, the kind of fall of this angelic being and uh, uh, others. And so uh, this view is, is trying to make sense of the geological record. Um, 
Of course, proponents of that view need to answer the question, well, why would God allow these seemingly destructive forces uh, responsible for vast animal suffering and death to play such a pivotal part in a creative process that is seemingly deemed good in Genesis 1? Uh, what does God mean by good if he used this process as, his, as one of his means? But either way, both of these views hold that natural events and the brokenness in nature is linked to a spiritual brokenness. Uh, there are spiritual causes. And the reason why that has legs is because the two most spiritually significant events in history, the death and resurrection of Jesus, were both accompanied by earthquakes. And this is really interesting and fascinating. Why is it that both at the crucifixion and at the resurrection, there was an earthquake, okay, maybe to move the stone away from the tomb, practical uh, side to it, but were these also, uh, were they simply a marker of the magnitude of what was happening? Or were they also indicating that there was something about what was happening that was reaching not just into the human heart, but also into nature itself? Um, food for thought. We, we don't, we're not going to bottom out this question, but we can see that spiritual events and natural events seem to be linked quite a lot. And I think we've sold a bit too much over to the New Age movement. Uh, we've lost a sense of the connection between nature and the spiritual and how those two things interact. I think there is room for us as Christians to regain a, a biblical perspective on how those two things work together. Um, so natural brokenness is linked to spiritual brokenness. What kind of God would allow natural disasters and diseases? At the end of the day, when all of our different ways of making sense of it are talked about, what kind of God are we talking about? What kind of God lies behind the world that we find ourselves in? Firstly, any uh, response to suffering, whether it's due to moral evil or natural evil, is incomplete without, without reference to uh, the cross. The, at the heart of the Christian faith is a God who knows what it is to suffer and who didn't just send us instructions on how to cope with a natural disaster or even illness, uh, but came actually himself to be with us and has gone on to suffer like us and for us so that whatever we face and whatever other people around the world are facing no one needs suffer alone uh, because there is a god who uh, has died so that we never need to uh, be alone and that so that evil uh, need not have the last word in our lives and that that is the bottom line sometimes we feel it sometimes we don't but that is at the heart of the Christian faith you don't see it anywhere else that there is a God who has suffered and somehow by his wounds we are healed and we don't always see that in this life it's, it's something that we have to embed within a bigger perspective but God doesn't always offer us answers but he does always offer us himself and that is the kind of God that we're commending to other people as well as we think about this question. Secondly, what kind of God? One who continues to intervene today. God is active in relieving human suffering um, through the work of uh, medical professionals, doctors, nurses, counsellors, those developing antibiotics, anaesthetics, vaccinations, caesarean sections, we talk about humanitarian aid workers, NGOs, social workers, all those who work on behalf of the poor to relieve poverty and bring justice. Whether they believe in God or not, the, the, the very thing that they're doing is living out the belief that all human beings are created with inherent dignity and that suffering is not divine punishment. And the words of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. Those don't come from nowhere. They are not abstract. They are grounded in the Judeo-Christian framework. Our culture, because it has been steeped in Christian values, thinks they're self-evident. 
But if you look at the ancient world, you see a very different set of values as to how we respond to people who are hurting and suffering. So, but we're talking about here a God who continues to intervene today. And all of those ways of helping have their roots in the Christian faith. And uh, we talked about the, the worm that um, Stephen Fry referred to uh, that I was talking about at the beginning, um, which can cause river blindness. Well, river blindness has been entirely eradicated in some parts of the world through very careful work of uh, scientists and um, the World Health Organization. And so human beings can have a key role in relieving and preventing human suffering and in a sense working out ways to, to do that. And they, we do so because all human beings are made in the image of God. It's not the case that some are more are valuable than others. Every human being matters. Um, and finally, um, what kind of God are we talking about? One who one day will make everything new and any response that we give, again, is not enough to just talk about the here and now. We, we need to look at a much bigger perspective. How do you fix a broken story? I have a first book on suffering where the penultimate chapter asks this question, can a broken story be fixed? And some people's lives are utterly ravaged by their experience of natural disasters and diseases, completely torn apart. How do you fix a broken story? Well, the Christian faith says you fix it by embedding it in a much bigger story, in, which is not finished yet, in which good wins and evil loses, and in which there will be a new heaven and new earth, which will be every bit as physical as this one, but also in which we will see God, and there will be no more evil and the suffering that it causes, and that God will do something extraordinary, that he will wipe every tear from our eyes, um, which means that there is hope. Um, there is hope for today and the future. And of course, our very bodies will be transformed as well. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And how do we know that? Because Jesus bodily rose from the dead. And that is our linchpin. That is our hope. And we will follow him in that regard.